It has been so long since the Carolina Panthers had hope. Now they finally have hope. You got Bryce Young. You got Jonathan Mingo. Uh, you got a defense that's absolutely ravenous. You got a new head coach that people generally agree was a good hire. Everything's looking up in Carolina. I don't know what to do with myself. It's been a while since we've seen this. I'm excited about it because there's a ton of players all over this roster that I love. Offense, defense. They've been lacking quarterback position. They took their swing. That made you really happy as a modern day alum. Of course. We'll see how it works. But yes, hope springs. I don't want to say eternal because it hasn't been there for a while. Hope springs anew in Carolina. We have a lot to go over today, including, again, extensive Bryce Young talk, all the other rookies they brought in, what happened at free agency, you know, the flip side of the trade to get up to number one in the first place, everything they gave up, why that price ultimately is probably just fine uh, for all parties involved. Uh, and of course, talking a little bit about Frank Reich and everybody that he has brought in as well. So uh, big, big, big show today. Jay, roll the intro. Stop me if you've heard this before, EJ, an NFC South team that went 7-10 and 10 that has a defense we like and uh, smashed the shit out of people in the run game last year. Again, third day in a row. Here we are. It feels like, you know, just keep going back with the needle to that song that you like. <laughs> keep pressing repeat <laughs> on the videos that are good. Uh, it is strangely the same, but also different, I think, in a lot of ways than the teams we've talked about for the last two days. So if you're watching every one of these and you watch the last two days, don't turn it off. It's actually going to be different, although it looks the same at the top. And I would say out of all the three NFC South teams that we have talked about, uh, obviously Carolina being the third, and you got the Falcons and the Saints who also kind of fall into that general description, I would say there's more long-term hope in Carolina than either of those because, again, they got a young, dynamic rookie quarterback. Uh, they got a young, potentially dynamic receiver in Mingo. We love what they're doing with the offensive line. We love the defense. Like there, There's more to be positive about in Carolina, in my opinion, than any other NFC South team. And I feel like we've been fairly positive so far in this division, but like Carolina's the one that I feel like if they win the division and they get into January, they might actually be able to do some damage. If they can lean on their offensive line like they did for the second half of last season, I agree with you. Carolina has been that. I call them the closet fun team for the last couple of years. You knew they probably weren't going to challenge for any kind of overall dominance. They were going to be interesting and they have a lot of fun players on the roster. So this year it feels like that's been elevated and the coaching hurdles for lack of a better term have been removed. Uh, and we're going to talk about that as well. But last year, even with those struggles, even with firing their head coach halfway into the season, transitioning to an interim head coach who did a great job, but that's never an easy situation. They still went 7-10. and 10. Again, most of those wins came in the back half of the season after Steve Wilkes took over and this team sort of forged an identity with the run. They were second in the division, 5-4 and four at home, struggled on the road at 2-6. and six. Last three games, though, 3-2, and two, a good strong surge. Still didn't have an answer at the quarterback spot, but got around that by just saying, hey, we're going to hand the ball off to Dante Foreman behind this you know, young and aggressive offensive line and make hay that way. Almost got him there. Almost got him over the hump. So pretty good 2022, all things considered, because they had a very rough ride. In 2023, I think a lot of those bumps have been smoothed out prior to the start of the season, and we're going to get a somewhat cleaner eval, even though there's been a lot of change. Well, going into last year, I remember when we did this series, we're like, hey, we kind of like the Panthers. Like, there's a lot here to like. And then they just completely fell flat on, flat on their face in the first half of the year. And we're like, OK, I guess we were, we were wrong about that. Make a coaching change. Wilkes energize the locker room. They start playing up to their level of talent. We're like, oh, that's what we expected to see. It was too little too late uh, for them to make a serious push. But, um, you know, they, they started playing like the Panthers we expected. Fortunately for them, they didn't all the way get it done and make the playoffs because going from uh, the 21st pick to the first pick is a hell of a lot more expensive than going from the ninth pick to the first pick. So maybe it was a little bit of a fortuitous 
tumble for them because I think they ended up in a better spot. Uh, but yes, last year was kind of a, a tale of two halves of the season for them. I feel like because of that, in our effectiveness summary, I'd love to see <laughs> sort of before rule left and after rule left as two different power scores. We didn't do that. We combined them all, but I guarantee some of these numbers went up in the second half of the season that really pulled their rank up, which is surprising because a lot of them are still in the 20s. So that means they started they really, were really low. So bad. <laughs> yeah. Effectiveness summary again, if you haven't been watching the series, is a new stat for us that we put together this year. Basing it on EPA per play, we're taking the league rank of the Panthers versus all their contemporaries on rushing offense, passing offense, rushing defense, passing defense, and then points scored and points allowed are the last two to round out our six measurements to create the power score. So on rushing offense, 11th. And that is the one, if you watched the second half of the Panthers last year, you're not really surprised by. They were decent running the ball in the first half, so they didn't have a big deficit to come up from. And they were excellent running the ball in the second half of the year. Passing offense, 29th. They never got good at that. They started off poor and stayed poor. So it makes sense that they'd have a, a league rank right down near the bottom of the NFL. Rush defense, 21st. A little bit surprising given their personnel. I'm expecting this one to come up this year because it feels like to me they have the horses to get this one done. It should be that rank should have been better last year. That I don't think necessarily had a lot to do with the coaching staff. I'm interested to see that number go up to make it easier for them to stay in games. If they can snuff out more drives, not allow easy runs for opponents, they're going to be in an even better position in 2023. Pass defense, 24th. Again, they've got pass rushers. They've got dudes in the secondary. They've even got good linebackers. They have enough players on defense and have had for a couple of years to have a better ranking than that. They need to. They cannot compete if they're going to have a 24th ranked pass defense versus EPA, you know, based on EPA. That's too low. That's giving the opponents too many chances through the air. Points scored, they came in 20th at 347. Uh, flipped it around for points allowed at 374. That was 19th, strangely. So the rankings on scoring and, you know, defensive scoring or limiting scoring on the defensive side, very similar. 20th, about you know, easing into bottom third of the league. Neither one of those were great. I think we expect the points scored to go up this year. And hopefully again, with defensive change, the points allowed to go down a little bit. And that would increase their margin. You take those six numbers, divide by six, gives them a bootleg power score of 21. Suitably low score for a team that underachieved for obvious reasons that we've talked about through the first half of the season. When that gets stanked, Stanked. <laughs> when that gets <laughs> stacked, it is a bit stank, but when that gets stacked against all their contemporaries in the league, that is the 28th best or worst power score that we've ranked so far in the series. Down near the bottom of the league, I don't think that's surprising to Carolina Panthers watchers, fans. Mm -hmm. uh, they probably feel like the team earned that ranking. Again, I don't think either one of us thinks with the changes that have been made for 2023 that that number will be in the low 20s again when we do this next year. And again, uh, similar story to the Bears who were in that general range, right? Uh, and we were like, okay, yeah, but the Bears had, had a, a little bit of a stretch there where they played like a real football team. How bad would it have been if that stretch didn't exist? Well, had how bad would the power score for Carolina would have been if they didn't have that late you know, second half of the season surge themselves. They, they might have legitimately been 30th <laughs> or more, or, or I guess lower, higher. I don't know. Yeah. It, worse. Worse. Yeah. yeah. That's probably a better way to put it. Suffice to say, this was just a, a bad team that finally got it together, but it was too little too late. I do want to emphasize uh, some of these schematic stats. And I know that a lot of these don't have a whole lot of carryover to this year. Uh, because again, new coaching staff and, you know, they're bringing in Ajiro Vero uh, to be the DC who we talked about. Uh, if you go watch the, the Broncos episode, if yes. you're a Panthers fan, you want to get a little bit of an idea of what Avero was doing in Denver last year, go watch the Broncos episode. You know, he comes from the Vic Fangio tree, uh, started out what 12 years ago as a, a QA under Vic and also worked under Greg Roman too. So he kind of worked both sides of the ball there in San Francisco, uh, coach under Brandon Staley runs a lot of Fangio-ish concepts, 
had to adjust his approach quite significantly in Denver last year due to personnel limitations because they took on a bunch of injuries there. Um, but comparing what the ideal Avero defense is, or at least what we think it is, versus what they did in Carolina last year, I believe, again, caveat here, believe that we're in for a pretty significant change. Because um, when you look at how the Panthers' defense was structured, they were fourth in cover three, but they also had an incredibly high blitz rate. What that tells me, and if you watch the Falcons episode, you know where I'm going with this, what that tells me is that they called an absolute metric shit ton of fire zone, meaning they're playing three deep, three under zone with five guys getting after the quarterback. And that fifth guy can be any number yeah. of different players. It can be a nickel. It can be a linebacker. Uh, in their case, like, I feel like Frankie Louvu was just an extra pass rusher for them with, with how often they rushed him from different spots all over the place, right? Um, and they, they do have a bunch of guys that I would consider – not positionless, but multi-position. And uh, most of them were involved pretty significantly in rushing the passer as well. And, and they did that a lot in order to create one-on-ones for Brian Burns, create uh, you know one-on-ones for Derek. Yutur uh, Gross Matos as well got a bunch of one-on-ones. They had four guys with 30-plus pressures, and they had another two in the high 20s. Like They absolutely buzzsawed their way through offensive lines with pressure. Also, by the way, a uh, really random stat that I was uh, looking up while doing research on this. Uh, Derek Brown had 45 pressures last year, which is one of the best among all interior defensive linemen. One sack, at least in terms of how NFL counts it, one sack. That's wild. That, that almost never happens. So if you're worried about Derek Brown not being a good pass rusher, uh, just remember, sacks are not the important stat here. It's about pressures. Uh, sacks can sometimes be... Uh, misunderstood for how much pressure they actually create. Derek Brown is a very, very good pass rusher, and they're loaded with pass rushers. So, again, what I'm trying to say is uh, Averro's defense, at least what we think Averro's ideal defense is as a Vic Fangio-ish based disciple, right, is more coverage-based than pressure-based. And last year, this defense was more pressure-based than coverage-based. I would imagine that we're going to flip that around pretty significantly. And uh, given their personnel, especially on the back end, I think it actually kind of suits them better. Feels like that new defense is going to patch a lot of the holes that they experienced last year. Or the new scheme is going to patch a lot of holes in their overall defensive performance. And that we're not going to see those ranks in the mid to low 20s. I wouldn't be surprised... I would be surprised, actually, if they jumped up to the top 10 because it's a lot to learn. It's a lot of change in one year, but I would not at all be surprised. In fact, I think I flatly expect that those numbers are going to be in like the mid to low teens, right? Yeah. 15, 18 on both counts, run and pass. Uh, Averro is a very good teacher. They have very good personnel at all levels. This is not one of the teams that has a great defensive line and a bad secondary or vice versa. They've they've been assembling defensive talent sort of religiously over the past two or three years. They're pretty well stacked on the defensive side of the ball. they got a lot of guys that can move. They're going to be able to cover up a lot of their, their warts or their holes from last year with just some consistency and stability. I think once they achieve that, they can sort of push towards greater heights. But if I had to set a sort of defensive target for next year, it would be mid packish on both of those numbers, and I think that'll be a very solid improvement. It's going to keep them in a lot more games. All I know for sure is that they're not going to be sixth in blitz rate on third and medium again, and they're not going to be fourth in blitz rate on third and long again. So, no. yeah, very much a, a more coverage-based defense in my estimation. In terms of run concept frequency, this one actually kind of took me by surprise a little bit because especially when Foreman came in and we watched them just carve people up with outside zone, they were ripping off huge gains on outside zone. Hmm. And in my head, like a lot of their most explosive plays were outside zone, and I expected to be that style of offense. And they get to the numbers, and no, they were, they were 21st in outside zone. They were very good at it, but they didn't call it that much. They were ninth in inside zone. They were first in duo. Mm-hmm. They mashed people with duo. Uh, they were eighth in power. So the vast majority of their runs were either inside zone, which typically hits inside the tackles, uh, or rather without a whole bunch of horizontal movement. It's more so 
uh, what's the what's the north south? That's, yes. that's the, the term I'm looking for. It's more of a north south run concept. Uh, again, duo north south run concept. Power north south run concept. Like they they were really majoring and just going at people. Despite in my head, a lot of my fondest memories of Foreman running over people were on outside zone. So uh, nice little. Uh, kick kick back to reality for me for what they actually were made me kind of go back and study them a little bit more just because I was surprised by that. They were also 26th in counter, 25th in draw, and 30th in pin and pull. But again, really what I, and especially knowing Frank Reich, uh, what I expect for them to do is to actually kind of continue majoring in inside zone and, and power and duo because that's what Frank did. Yeah, we'll call that highlight bias. Yeah, uh, because some of their highlight runs, as you said, the ones that ended up, you know, being splashed across. If anybody was watching Panthers highlights in the second half, we were. Uh, you saw those flashier, bigger, sort of brighter runs to the outside. But the bread and butter, when you go back to the numbers, and it's not surprising given their offensive line talent or Dante Foreman being their lead back. Like those are all guys aligned to line it up, smack you in the mouth, break ho- holes open on the inside of kind of any flavor and rip off the predominant majority of their gains that way. But then, you know, the 20 yarder is outside zone and you go, oh, they're an outside zone team. But you go back to the numbers and you go, no, this is a, this is a smash mouth run team for sure. Flipping it over to the passing offense real quick. And again, none of this really translates to this year because it's new coaching staff and a new quarterback, but still uh, wanted to, to emphasize it. Uh, they were heavy on play action last year. They were 12th in play action, which you would expect for a very run-heavy offense to begin with. They got the ball out quick. They were 11th fastest in average time to throw, which considering their uh, – God, how many quarterbacks did they have last year? Four? Uh, they had three for sure. They had uh, Darnold, Mayfield, P.J. Walker. Uh, did anybody throw significant passes for them? Fourth? Jacob Eason. Uh, God damn, it was rough last three year. Three for five, yeah. so not but, really. But, you know, all those guys are known for kind of getting it out quick, so that's not super surprising to me for them to be 11th fastest. Um, air yards percentage, this was interesting because, again, I, I talked about in my head I thought they were more of like an outside zone team. Their, uh, their air yards percentage was the exact same as the 49ers, which are more of a yak-based offense, right? 45% of their yards came through the air rather than after the catch, whereas 55% came after the catch. Literally the exact same percentage as the Niners. They were both tied for 30th in the league. The big difference, obviously, though, is that the 49ers build their offense around Yak, and they they plan for it by drafting players like Debo, drafting players like Kittle, Ayuk, uh, you know, trading for Christian, obviously the other side of the McCaffrey trade all these guys that are great in space with the ball in their hands. So they were still highly effective as a yak based offense. Uh, Carolina less. So they, they, they don't necessarily have the same horses to rely on here. I'm going to give you the ball three yards past the line of scrimmage. Go get me 12. They, they can't do that. So their yards per attempt was 19th. Whereas if I recall correctly, the Niners yards per attempt was first in the league. So uh, it's the same, but very different. Same approach, different result. Yes. And again, what we're going to see this year is going to be different from that still um, because of Reich and the new coaches and what they're going to tend to do. And uh, you said earlier, I think that's actually a better fit. Talking about the defensive personnel, I think Reich's uh, offense that he ran in Indianapolis is actually a better fit for the personnel that Carolina has in place now. And a better fit for Bryce Young as well, too, um, who's like, the ultimate point guard. You know, he's not the biggest. He's not the tallest. He's not the fastest. Are you, really? He's not big? Uh, I know. Shocker. But in terms of uh, doing all the thing that doing all the things that Frank wants his quarterbacks to do, which is be able to read things pre-snap, make adjustments at the line of scrimmage. Like it's a very um, labor intensive system for quarterbacks because they're in charge of a lot. They do a lot of the line of scrimmage. Uh, you know, being able to identify rotations post snap and know exactly how your receivers are going to be adjusting their routes based on that. Like it's not a it's not a simple offense. You know, this is not um I don't want to use the word hand holding, but 
uh, like what Steichen was doing, you know, who used to coach under Frank, obviously, but like what Steichen was doing in, in Philly, um, where it was like simplicity through aggression. And it, they weren't doing a whole lot of complicated things in Philly, but they were very aggressive. And so they made things simple through aggression because everything turns into man coverage when it's 25 plus yards down the field anyway. Frank is more complex than that. And he puts more on the shoulders of the quarterback. There's more work that they have to do to get from one to two to three. Right. Um, and I, I think that's kind of a product of their offense being less vertical and more so focused on the intermediate era, intermediate area where there's more traffic, more bodies, uh, more things that you have to process. Again, I, I don't want to say that Steichen's offense is 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 handholding. It's not, but it just it requires a a different level of uh, what's the word mental fortitude mm-hmm. to handle the workload in a Frank Reich offense. Carson Wentz once upon a time could not really do that. Uh, Bryce Young absolutely can. It's not really surprising when you think about who Reich was as a player and how he won. Mm-hmm. He was a successful quarterback in his own right, but he won with exactly that kind of approach. So it's not surprising that that carries over to the offense that he is now teaching as a coach. And it is about how can I win by being prepared before I get to the line, as I get to the line, early in the down. Reich was never a guy that was going to beat you with his arm or really with his legs. He was going to beat you with his brain. Yes. He had a good enough arm. Uh, His legs were pretty average given the the area that he played in. Uh, But he was winning basically as he walked up to the line or he wasn't winning. So it's not surprising that he puts that on his quarterbacks now. One quick note, and then we'll get right back to the show. We are right in the middle of summer officially. That means we're going out to the lake, we're going to the beach, we're having pool parties and cookouts and all the fun stuff we do over summer. So if you want to look good and clean and tidy when you go to all these events, that's where Manscaped comes in. If you don't own a trimmer, but you do want to take care of yourself, you want to look good, Manscaped has everything you need. You don't have to go out and start shopping for individual products and putting together a list. They have everything all in one place. It is the easiest thing ever. They've got the new Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer with ceramic blades and skin safe technology to kind of reduce those nicks and cuts. There's also a 7,000 RPM motor on that thing, an LED spotlight, and oh, by the way, it's waterproof. There's also the Weed Whacker for ear and nose hair trimming, also with skin safe technology and an even more powerful motor. It also comes with the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant and Crop Reviver, plus their ultra premium body wash and shampoo and conditioner that all smell really, really good. And it's pretty much the only body wash that I ever really use myself. The performance package also comes with Manscaped boxers and a free travel bag to keep everything together when you're traveling for the summer. Like I said, they have literally everything you can think of. So if you want that all for yourself, you can get 20% off your order. Any order, it doesn't even have to be the whole package. It can just be an individual item if you're in need of something specific. You can get 20% off that plus free shipping with promo code bootleg at manscaped.com. Again, that is 20% off plus free shipping with promo code bootleg at manscaped.com. Thank you once again to Manscaped for sponsoring this show. And with that, let's get back to it. Yeah, it's about touch, timing, and anticipation more than anything else. And if you don't have touch, timing, or or anticipation, you're not going to be good in this system. And unfortunately, a lot of the quarterbacks that he was going through in Indy, the only one that really fit that bill was Rivers. And after Rivers, they they kept cycling through guys, and they just, they just couldn't find somebody who could who could execute this style of offense uh, to the degree that that they needed to. And unfortunately, Frank paid the price for that. But it doesn't mean he's a bad coach. It doesn't mean his system doesn't work. There's been a lot of Super Bowls won by quarterbacks that fit that description: Drew Brees, Tom Brady. Hey, is that a Huey? <laughs> no, this one's even closer. Oh my God! <laughs> Here we go. Are the Cobras back? What is that? No, that's a Blackhawk. Now let's get closer. That's fucking sick, though. Anyway. <laughs> Military Aircraft Identification 201. Every time we record an episode, the Marine Corps decides to come say hi or, or whatever those colors are. I don't know. I'm not a military expert, but it's fucking cool. Anyway. Anyways. Uh, Scott Fitterer, Frank Reich. We've been on the subject of Frank Reich. Mm-hmm. The power structure in totality. They were building a staff that 
originally we were intrigued by. And then we got excited by as they added more and more names. And eventually, by Super Bowl week, you know, when they were adding in Josh McCown as their quarterback's coach, and, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're adding in D'Angelo Hall to come in and help with the DBs, I reached uh, uh, fangirl levels of excitement for this coaching staff. I love everything that they've built here. The good news for Carolina fans is the way this staff makes us feel this year and the way that it's been assembled is similar to the way Brian Dable's staff with the Giants did last year Mm -hmm. when he kept adding coaches and we kept seeing names of who was going to end up on the Giants coaching staff. We were like, I don't know, that's a pretty good staff. Well, that's a really good staff. Oh, I like the mix that he's putting together. Oh, those aren't all like his guys. He's grabbing from different disciplines and different coaching trees and We got really excited about that. And Reich, uh, to a different level of diversity of of schemes, but it makes us feel the same. It gives us the same sort of gut reaction of, oh, that's a solid staff. Oh, that's a good staff. Ooh, that could be a great staff for a first year, you know, whole group together. So Fitter is interesting at the GM spot. A little bit of a gambler, and that's a sort of extension of his owner's persona, I think, in terms of, willing to look at what a draft pick is really worth um, as opposed to a more traditional NFL view of what draft picks are worth. He's brought some of that gambler's mentality over to his GM seat. They go and get Frank Reich. Uh, That's a home run after the rule debacle. We'll just call it that. Losing the team midseason, basically losing the locker room. They had to let him go. You know, all credit to Steve Wilkes for writing the ship for the second half of the year, but they decide the way they want to move forward is with Frank Reich. And I think that is there was both sadness that Wilkes wasn't retained for his efforts, but also, hey, if you're not going to retain him, this is a really good option. And then the staff starts to get built and really want to talk about, again, another assistant head coach. Uh, and this is assistant head coach, running backs coach. And that's Deuce Staley, mm-hmm. a name that a lot of NFL fans will remember. Last two years with Detroit in the same role, strangely enough, assistant head coach and running backs coach. That's an odd transition. But Deuce is going to bring a lot of fire to Carolina. There is, uh, I think Reich said the other day, there is no medium switch with Deuce. It is on or off. So Carolina fans who remember Steve Smith was the same way as a wide receiver, as a player. Like you either did it up to Steve's standard or you didn't, but there was no middle ground. And Deuce as a coach is already bringing that to Carolina. There is a standard and he is there to establish it. And if you do not meet it or follow it, you're not going to be there. And that's going to set a very different tone in the building from Rule and his staff. Offensive coordinator Thomas Brown spent the last three years with the Rams as the assistant head coach slash tight end coach. So apparently Carolina just likes collecting assistant head coach title guys. Uh, But Brown ended his career at Georgia as the fifth leading rusher in Georgia Bulldog history, which is fun. He's since been pushed down to 10th because, you know, a lot of good tailbacks go through Georgia. But when he left, he was fifth on the list. Yeah, just a few good running backs. A couple of guys that play in some other league. (laughs) Uh, Defensive coordinator, Ajiro Rivero, uh, was the DC for the Broncos last year. We've talked about him. A lot of hope for him with this defensive unit because he comes into a very talented unit on all three levels. This is not, oh, I'm going to have to put my system in and then I'm going to have to find some guys that fit my system. There's going to be some turnover and guys that played better under the previous system and not as well under this system. But overall, they've been sort of stockpiling defensive draft picks for a while. He is not short on guys to run his system. uh, And that's exciting for the potential for first year success. They could be very good right out of the gate. And then special teams coordinator Chris Tabor back for his second season. So one of those rare holdovers when there's a head coaching change that the head coach comes in and goes, yeah, keep doing what you're doing. Well, if there was ever a coach uh, to get kept, oftentimes who we see does get kept is the special team coordinator Yeah, because they're plugged into everybody in the locker room. They know all the young guys. They work with all the young guys, both on offense and on defense. Everybody usually loves them. Uh, you know, very rarely do you find a special teams coordinator that is uh, the ire of the locker room. Um, <laughs> and so typically when when we see a coordinator get kept, it's either, you know, you're so good at your job like Vic Fangio that you roll from regime to regime or you're a good special teams guy. Strangely enough, being good enough at your job 
Gets you kept around, James Campen, the offensive line coach, mm-hmm. also in his second season with the Panthers, and was the main reason the Carolina's rushing attack went ballistic for the last half of last year. Um, had a very good young line and developed them very quickly, and I think Frank saw that, saw the relationship with that line, and went, you know, we don't want to screw that up. You're doing just fine. You want to stay on my staff. Also played seven years in the NFL with the Packers and the Saints. Sean Jefferson is the wide receivers coach. Name familiar to lots of folks that listen to this show. 17 years of NFL coaching experience. Had a 13-year career as an NFL wide receiver. And, oh, yeah, his kid Van plays for the hometown Rams. And a very good receiver in his own right. Yep. And then Josh McCown, you mentioned, is the QB coach. Played 18 years in the NFL for 10 different teams. Uh, Has been bandied about even as a head coach candidate uh, early in his career. Retirement, we'll Mm -hmm. call it, and ends up as the QB coach, which I think is a better fit for him. Again, getting his NFL coaching legs under him in Carolina on Frank's staff. I think that's really significant that Frank was a quarterback. He's known for developing quarterbacks. In his, you know, new stop in Carolina, his first quarterback's coach is McCowney. Like, that's a position they're going to draft the quarterback of the future. That is a high leverage coaching spot. And he goes out and hand selects McCowney. And I I do think McCown will be a head coach sooner rather than later. Um, but correctly, he's starting at quarterback's coach and not at head coach. And I mean, he, he took interviews like indeed widely reported, like the Texans wanted to hire him as their head coach straight away. Uh, I think this will be good for him to first be a quarterback's coach, then probably be a coordinator in short order after that. And, you know, take take the extra couple years, take the extra couple steps, uh, work your way quickly up the ladder, quicker than most people, and, and then be a head coach. But I would imagine by 2028, he's going to be he's going to be helming the ship somewhere because he does seem to be on that track. Defensive uh, coaches, Dom Capers <laughs> still kicking. He's been coaching since you were a toddler. Yeah. Like legitimately since you were a toddler. 100 <laughs> percent. 49 years of coaching experience. Just say that again. 49 years of coaching experience. Like, he's coached twice as long as a bunch of these players have been alive. Yeah. I mean, he's coached 20 years longer than I've been alive. Well, 20-ish. So the <laughs> this is one of the more fitting titles. Senior defensive assistant. Just <laughs> let him do whatever he wants. If he hasn't seen it, it probably doesn't exist. A very solid addition to a staff to be able to say, hey. And, I, you know, I think that probably feels good for a guy like Ajira Vero, who has worked with some titans in the defensive coaching industry, to have a guy like Dom Capers to say, hey, I'm having a problem with X. How have you done it? <laughs> Capers is going to be able to pull out not one, but like three old notebooks and go, well, we did it this way here. We did it this way here. And then we did it this way. Which one looks good to you? That's a tremendous amount of just knowledge that he's got kicking around in his head. Todd Walsh is the defensive line coach. 27 years of coaching experience. There's a theme here, including 16 in the NFL. Was with Detroit for the last two years. Helped Aiden Hutchison to NFL Defensive Rookie of the Month in three consecutive months. I missed that. I knew he'd gotten at least a couple of those awards. I didn't realize he rolled he off was three in a row. But you know why? Because eventually they let him stand up. That was that was the key. He's a two-point rusher, and eventually uh, they realized that. And, oh, shocker, he's great again. Yeah, pull his hand up, and look what happens. Yeah. And D'Angelo Hall, you mentioned, is the assistant DB coach. Uh Coaching debut after a 14-year NFL career as an NFL DB and later as an NFL analyst. Yeah, all-around great guy, too. Uh, Really excited to see him added to the staff. Uh, I always love it when staffs have a bunch of either former players on it, whether collegiate or NFL level. Uh, Those types of staffs tend to be able to relate better to the players. Mm -hmm. Uh, So the vibes in the locker room tend to be better. Uh, and, and usually those, and, and Frank himself, obviously former player too. So, mm-hmm. uh, usually those types of staffs end up like never losing a locker room because mm-hmm. of that re- relatability factor. Right. Um, now given all that information, I want to zoom in on the receiving core specifically, and we will talk Miles Sanders, uh, and we will talk Bryce Young a little bit more, uh, but the receiving core in particular fascinates me Mm -hmm. 
Because there's a million of them. Yep. And yes, they did trade DJ Moore, and, and DJ Moore was the clear number one, and DJ Moore still would be the clear number one today if he was still there. But there's no fewer than four guys that are going to get significant snaps here. Obviously, Adam Thielen, they brought in a free agency. DJ Chark, they brought in. Uh, Terrace Marshall was, uh, we both had very high grades on him coming out of LSU. He's still there, hopefully in a more productive passing attack with a better quarterback throwing him the ball. We could finally see that talent unlocked. And, oh, by the way, they brought in a 225-pound freak of nature that runs 4-4 in Jonathan Mingo as well. So how all of these guys stack together, I still don't know yet. I would imagine your week one starters are going to be uh, Thielen in the slot, Marshall and Chark outside, and mixing Mingo in. Yep. But in terms of who's getting the most targets, who's getting the most catches, who's getting the most red zone work, like where the production is going, that part I don't know yet. And I think most people still can't quite figure that it, figure that out either. And, you know, looking at where they're going in fantasy, like they're, they're all going in like super late. You know, Jonathan Mingo is the highest drafted uh, Panthers receiver on average, which is, by the way, wrong. Don't do that. Yeah, it's like, uh, no, he's, he's a rookie. He's not, he's not starting, uh, but he's going as wide receiver 62. So again, we're talking about highest, you know, <laughs> wide receiver six, right? Yeah. Uh, Thielen's going as wide receiver, wide receiver 64. There's the value because A, he will start, and B, he's the exact type of receiver that Bryce will lean on early uh, just as a chain mover extraordinaire. Um, DJ Chark's going as wide receiver 68, and Marshall's going as wide receiver 91. So, again, I don't know where all the production's going, but for me just based on what we know about these players and based on what we know about Bryce. Mm -hmm. When it comes to target volume and catches, I would bet it's going to be Adam Thielen. And when it comes to explosives and red zone opportunity, I think Terrace is the one that I would rather take my shot on literally in the last round because he's going to wide receiver 91 uh, over Mingo and over Chark. Doesn't mean I won't draft Mingo. Doesn't mean I won't draft Chark. Mm -hmm. But if I'm trying to value hunt in this receiving core because somebody's catching passes, like Bryce Young's over under is like 3,400 yards, right? Somebody's catching those balls. I would bet it's going to be Thielen uh, and, and Terrace for me. Yeah, I am here for the Terrace Marshall Jr. love. Uh, I had a very high grade on him, have held out hope. He's been stymied by poor quarterback play. There is no other way to say that. Uh, poor offensive design in some cases. But even so, last year averaged 17.5 yards a catch. So if you want to go down the field and if you watched any of Bryce Young's highlight tape at Alabama or, or truly scouted games of him when he was playing for Nick Saban, he can throw deep and does. This mm -hmm. is this is not a dink and dunk all yak quarterback, not even close. When we say point guard, we're not talking about all short passes. We're talking about true distribution to all levels of the field and all sides of the field. He is, I think, probably arguably the best guy in this rookie class in terms of going through the whole field, left to right, short to deep. And when those deep opportunities open up and Marshall has the tools to do that, he's going to be getting some one-on-ones. He only caught 28 balls last year. He doesn't have like deep respect from a lot of DBs around the league. They know that he can do things, but they've never seen him do them sort of routinely and all the time. Again, he made 28 catches for 490 yards. I could see those numbers, the catch numbers at least, double. Mm -hmm. I could see him getting around 50 catches, 52 catches pretty easily. And even if that yards per reception number comes down like a yard or two, you go 50 catches at 15 and a half or 16 and a half yards a piece. The yardage total is there for you. Touchdowns, another thing. You only had one last year. He hasn't proven to be a tremendous red zone threat between the 20s in terms of bunch of catches, bunch of yards. And again, for fantasy purposes, if you're talking about best ball, those spiky weeks, he's, he's going to have them. Yeah. He's built for spiky weeks, and so is Mingo. Like I, I would bet Mingo's going to have a couple games where he goes off because mm -hmm. 
Again, he breaks press coverage really easily. He makes some crazy ass catches. His overall drop rate was a little bit worrisome, but at the same time, he made some incredible acrobatic catches. And I, I more err on the side of that mm-hmm. than the random kind of, you know, didn't finish looking the ball in type drops that he would have. Uh, so Mingo will will have his weeks, but for this year specifically, like who's going to have the most spikes? I would probably say Terrace and then Mingo. And then DJ Chark, I just got, I got no idea what to do with DJ Chark. But again, if I want the week-to-week consistency, it's Adam Thielen. If I want the spikes, I go with Terrace and then Mingo. I just feel like they're the order that they're going in right now it's not correct. <laughs> is, is slightly off uh, for me. I'm probably going to end up with all of them on at least a few of my rosters, but I'm, I'm going to be taking them in a different order. Um, I also want to touch a little bit on uh, Miles Sanders at RB19. That also seems a little bit low. Agreed. Considering how good the offensive line is, considering how, you know, Frank himself does have a history of leaning on his run game. Uh, like this is... Uh, this is not a coaching staff that I think will shy away from giving Sanders 15 touches a game. And Sanders has all the talent in the world and also developed as a running back in Philly. His vision got better. His feet got better. Like he became a better player when he left Philly than when he got there. Um, And even though I love Chuba, Chuba will get his touches. Like Sanders is still the guy in that backfield. Uh, and RB19 seems very low to me. The only reason I could justify 19 is because of Chuba Hubbard. And if you told me I was going to say that two years ago, I would have told you you're nuts. <laughs> but Chuba Hubbard, again, behind a very good line in Carolina, stole a bunch of touches. He had 4.9 a carry. Mm-hmm. He was very good down the stretch last year, even with Foreman dominating, even with Foreman being the primary touch getter, yard getter, all that. Sanders is going to be that guy again, but don't discount Chuba Hubbard chewing into a significant amount of that going into year three now and really available to tear up five yards of carry. For reference, by the way, Chuba is going at RB55. So you could take either one and feel good about the value. Um, yep. It just kind of feels like overall the Carolina offense is is uh, is suppressed right now in terms of value. Maybe it's because nobody's paying attention to them. Maybe it's because nobody. I think it's uncertainty. Them, yeah, you know, I think it's uncertainty but, with all the changeover, coaching staff, a lot of new pieces. Like they brought in new receivers, they have a new tight end, they obviously have a new quarterback triggering the entire thing. They have a new running back. Like lots of turnover will breed a little bit of uncertainty, and uncertainty in fantasy basically makes people wait. Which is okay, because that means that I get them easier. Correct. Uh, If you also happen to be a Miles Sanders truther, I know that there there are dozens of us, uh, and and you want to try to capitalize on him in best ball and take advantage of that, uh, of the fact that he is going as the 19th running back off the board right now. You can use promo code BOOTLEG over Underdog Fantasy. They will match your deposit up to 100. So whether you want to... uh, you know, go after his season-long totals, which I got to look up what the exact numbers are. We'll probably throw them on the screen. Mm-hmm. Um, but I remember looking at them last week, and I was like, ooh, that seems conservative. Low. Yeah. Um, or, again, if you want to, you know, look at pick during the season, you want to do best ball mania, you want to do private leagues with your friends, uh, you want to use it for mock drafts, like whatever your purpose is on Underdog Fantasy, that deposit match will help you with all of them. And you get it up to $100, so they'll basically give you a free $100 if that's what you happen to deposit. Once again, using promo code bootleg, uh, we thank Underdog for sponsoring this entire series and sponsoring the entire show for the year. We could not do this without them. They are instrumental in what we do. So supporting them basically supports us along the way, and we appreciate that. Uh, All right, EJ, free agents. Let's talk free agency. A lot of turnover on this team, not surprisingly. Um, starts with interior defensive line. Matt Ioannidis moves on. He was 55% of their snaps on that interior defensive line. And then all the skill position or or ball handlers, as we like to call them, turnover that's not surprising given the change in coaching staff. Sam Darnold goes to the 49ers. DJ Moore gets traded to the Bears. Deontay Foreman gets signed by the Bears as a free agent. And Phillip Walker gets signed by the Bears as a free agent. So Bears just kind of grabbing a little Carolina love to help buttress their offense and those are again not 
super significant given where this team was going to go with a new coaching staff, with a quarterback. Uh, you know, they brought in Miles Sanders to replace Dante Foreman. Again, not surprising given the turnover there. Some serious horsepower leaving the building, but they've replaced it in ways already. So it's not the kind of free agency losses or exodus that really worries me. It's just what happens when you have this kind of change. Uh, like I would say DJ Moore is significant and I would say Ionitis is significant, but not irrecoverable if that's the right word for this, right? Like they already did a good job of kind of recovering from the loss of DJ Moore in aggregate. Mm -hmm. uh, now, none of them are as good individually as DJ Moore, but it's not like their receiving core is barren. No, they got dudes. We just went over all of them like yeah. they're, they're going to be OK. I still think they could add more in the draft next year, but it's not like they're hurting right now. We're not worried about Bryce Young not having anybody to throw to, that's for sure. Yeah, they'll be fine. Plus, they're going to run the shit out of the ball anyway. So in the end, it's it's fine. Ioannidis is one that, uh, that does hurt. Um, I don't believe he's signed right now. Um, that kind of surprises me because like when I think of Ioannidis, I think of a very good rotational interior defensive lineman. So maybe there's a health thing I'm not aware of, but I didn't think he played poorly last year. Uh, so if they can get him back, I, especially for a for a cheap contract, he's only like six million or something like that. If they can get him for less than that, um, I would love that. I would love to add him back into that rotation because I do think that he is a solid rotational interior defensive lineman. In terms of who they did bring back, uh, Ian Thomas at three point three million. Uh, they brought back Shaq Thompson at six point three million, Bradley Bozeman at six million uh, to be their center. Uh, Cam Irving still kicking around at thirty one. He's had a very long and successful career. Surprisingly, yes, that started out <laughs> a little bit rocky, but one of those guys that's found his footing and keeps finding jobs. Uh, Stephen Sullivan they also brought back for under a million. Um, and then J.J. Jansen, the long snapper. We don't talk about long snappers ever on this show. I at least want to say his name. There you go. Long snappers return. Eddie Pinero's back. So, uh, again, mostly kind of like housekeeping contracts. No no earth-shattering deal to keep in-house talent. Uh, and then for third-party free agents, obviously Miles Sanders, the most expensive one, about $6.4 million. D.J. Chark's making five. Shy Tuttle, they brought in six and a half from their division rival Saints. Again, another interior defensive line piece that I'm a big fan of. Uh, Andy Dalton, also at $5 billion to try to guide the young Bryce Young. If Andy's playing, something has gone horribly wrong, so we hope that he's not. Uh, and then the most money they spent, of course, is on Adam Thielen at $8.3 to uh, to give some sort of reliable slot target to Bryce. Overall, I'm satisfied with this. Yeah, back to Ioannidis. It feels like they want to give their young guys at that interior defensive line rotation some run. Uh, last couple of years, they've gone out and got Marquand McCall and Brevion Roy, big guys who can sort of snap eat in the middle. Maybe they're just having a youth movement there. Shy Tuttle is the starter so that they don't have a big drop off. But in terms of you know, defensive line, we talked about this even in yesterday's episode, needs to be a rotation. feels like they kind of want to see what those guys have got. Oh, I forgot. Von Bell. And they also brought Hayden Hurst in, both a little over $7 million too. So, uh, again, quite spendy in free agency overall this year. No, no like, earth-shattering contracts. Again, pretty much everybody was under $10 million. Actually, yeah, everybody was under $10 million, But a bunch of solid guys, down eaters, um, you know, role players. Like, they, they didn't completely remake the roster, but considering how many assets they had to give up to go get number one and knowing that they weren't going to have a bunch of draft picks. Uh, Cause I think they did the trade before free agency, like right before free agency, right? Yeah, it was early. It wasn't right at the 11th hour before the draft. This was a, we want to go get it. There was some sort of flex. There were other offers and they decided they wanted to have it. When you hear their sort of internal discussions, by the way, shout out to the Panthers for being transparent uh, they're running their own series, which is a little bit like Hard Knocks. First, uh, first episode just debuted a couple days ago. Really gives you an inside look at the organization, and they do that with the draft as well. After these things go down, they don't treat them like state secrets. And they basically said at that point, hey, if we don't do it now, we're not going to get the chance. Somebody else is going to pay for it. Do we want it or don't we? And the sort of power trio at the top between Scott Fitterer, Reich, 
And their owner sat down and said, are we doing this or are we not? And they said, we're doing this. And they went and did it. They paid the price and they were fine with that. They knew where they were going at that point. Um, and so that sort of sets the course for everything else because that's the position you've got to get right first. And they did that sort of definitively. That was a very conscious choice. It wasn't reactive. They didn't get a phone call saying, if you don't do this, it was like, are we doing this or not? If, we, if we're doing it, we're doing it right now. And it was earlier, I think, a little bit than usual considering those sort of how those top trades go. A word on Von Bell. I bet Von Bell is going to have a, and this is going to sound a little weird, a Tayshawn Gibson-like season for the Carolina Panthers. Just resurgent, very solid, making plays every week. Yeah, and I don't even know if it's resurgent because he played really well last year. And he was certainly overshadowed, but he played very solidly in the role that he played. And he's coming into a Carolina defense that has a ton of talent around him, so he's not going to, for the most part, going to have to be doing other people's jobs and he can just do the job they brought him in to do. And he was, again, I think better at that than most people thought he was last year. He's not one of those safeties that is completely multidimensional, but he's better than people think. And I think he's going to be able to, I don't want to say freelance, but just like go hit in that defense. I think people are going to be really surprised by how well he plays. There's a lot of talent here. That's what I'm, I'm trying to, sell folks on the dream of the Carolina Panthers winning double digit games. They have enough talent to do it. Yes, they do. Uh, which by the way, that brings us to the draft where they added again, not a, not a huge mm -hmm. amount of names because they gave up a, a bunch of picks to go up to number one, but the names they brought in were exceptional. They had a phenomenal five person draft class. Four out of five. I'm like, Yes, when I see these names come off the board. The fifth one, I'm like, I can see it. Like, I get it. I see the fit. And that makes a very good draft class. Again, one pick in rounds, each in rounds one through five. Round one, pick one overall, Bryce Young. We've talked about him. Round two, pick 39, wide receiver Jonathan Mingo out of Ole Miss, who made a huge jump between his second to last year in college and his final year in college, really because of the usage, because of the way that offense featured him in his final year two years out from from grad well we'll call it graduating <laughs> from leaving to go to the league um they used him in a very defined and small role he had about three routes that he ran and he got a few touches out of the backfield as well but that was it that was all they did with him and this last year they just took the lid off and said we're going to move you all over the formation we're going to run you in routes at every depth and Oh, all of a sudden, a lot of people's eyes open to Jonathan Mingo's potential because physically, he always had that. He's a huge guy. He's fast. He reminds a lot of people of A.J. Brown, yeah. who came from the same school and had a similar physical profile. So that was a natural comp. But really, that jump from two years ago to last year was what I think caught a lot of scouts' eyes and really what got him drafted so high, 39th overall. I like his... Future potential in this offense, again, I think he's being drafted a little high in fantasy as a rookie, given the talent surrounding him. But, you know, next year, all bets are off. We'll see. Round three, pick 80, edge DJ Johnson out of Oregon. This is a player I liked but didn't love. And again, he doesn't have to be an instant impact guy in Carolina. In fact, he might be a third stringer, and that might be fine. Mm -hmm. He brings a lot of skills that other players on their lines have. And he can learn how to develop and sort of round out his game and see where he fits. So it's not a pick I'm like, oh, I hated that. But at the same time, I was like, mm, were there other players I valued a little bit more? I like him better because of his landing spot. But this was the only one I was even lukewarm about. Round four, pick 114, guard Chandler Zavala out of North Carolina State. One of our favorite interviews. You can see that interview on this channel um, from the Shrine Bowl this year. Fantastic guy, fantastic player, um, college teammate of Vicky Aquano, who he now gets to go and play next to in the pros. Just a super versatile, powerful, smart, humble guy. Can play inside, outside, can play left side, right side, doesn't care. Guard, tackle. He's actually started at all four of those spots. Really, really like the player. Love the fit overall. Loves to be a mauler. Has better feet than people think. Huge value for me in round four. And then round five, pick 145, safety. Jamie Robinson out of Florida State. A little bit undersized, but absolute fireball. Um, I think, 
again, mixing him with guys like Chin and Von Bell is a really good landing spot for him. Uh, one more note on Zavala with both Austin Corbett and Christensen, you know, kind of recovering from injuries this offseason. Corbett in particular, we're not entirely sure if he's going to start the season on the pup list. Well, I can almost guarantee you he will. Um, I'm not entirely sure when he's coming back is what I'm trying to say. So Zavala will likely get snaps sooner rather than later. And <laughs> once he's on the field, yeah. it might be tough to get him off. I'm not even going to say might. It is going to be difficult to displace that guy, just like it is on the offensive line. And the fact that he can play left side or right side means that he's like the ultimate swing guard. So if Corbett somehow miraculously is healthy enough to play uh, this year, uh, like week one, great. But if Christensen isn't healthy enough, then he could play left side next to Icky and be totally fine. So uh, I love that picture from a flexibility standpoint because they are insulated both at left guard and at right guard, and they're going to be totally fine. Uh, also, Jamie Robinson, that was also one of my favorite picks. I loved Jamie Robinson. He's an awesome, awesome safety. Reminds me a lot of Vaughn as well. He is an absolute hitter uh, when he comes downhill. Like, even though he's not the biggest guy, like, he will smack you. He has no qualms about, you know, filling a run lane from a 12-yard depth in quarters. He did it all the time in college. Uh, also, very, very explosive in short areas when he's in coverage. Considering how much quarters I expect them to play, which they did play a lot of quarters last year under the previous staff, but Coach Avero is probably going to dial that up even more. Um He's a perfect fit for it because that's what he was great at in college. So uh, love, love, love the Robinson pick as well. Uh, flipping over to undrafted assets, you know, they really did have to do a bunch of heavy lifting with the UDFA class because they were short on draft picks or relatively short on draft picks. Uh, they got Rajon Wright, the corner out of Oregon State, who I know you saw in person at his pro day. Mm -hmm. uh, Jalen Redman uh, from Oklahoma. This one, I don't... I mean, I get it, but I don't get it, right? His injury history looks like a freaking CVS receipt, okay? It's it's an extensive yep. medical history, and there's probably red flags all over the place. But at the same time, you can't tell me <laughs> that a former five-star edge converted to interior defensive lineman who's that explosive, who's that quick, who's that fluid, doesn't deserve a seventh-round pick somewhere. Like, I just... just Toss one, right? It, it's it's a lotto ticket at that point. So allowing the Panthers, without even using a, a draft pick, to get somebody with the upside of Jalen Redmond for free. I mean, his contract's probably, you know, what, a couple hundred thousand, something like that. It's it's nothing. So great pickup by them as a UDFA. I think he's got a legit chance to make the roster if he is healthy. Uh, Cameron Peoples, the running back out of App State, not super bursty, not super fast, but is just a Ball of butcher knives, super physical, definitely fits their style. Uh, and then Tyon Evans, who is a lot faster, is a lot burstier, uh, would also love to see where he fits in the rotation too because that's like six running backs they're going to have yeah. that could legitimately make the roster. So uh, they got a bunch of guys here, and I'm really excited about it. Jalen Redman I'll talk about for a second. I think just like we said, the Saints played poker with Derek Carr and won, didn't end up giving up a pick. In a much smaller version of that, the Panthers ended up playing poker with Jalen Redmond and the rest of the league and said, I don't think anybody's going to risk it because of that extremely thick medical dossier. But when this guy is healthy on the field, he legitimately has like second or third round talent. Yeah, easily. Massive amount of input, just can't stay healthy. So they wait. If it works out, it'll be a, a much sort of more muted version of Pittsburgh's draft where they took chances on, you know, medical red flags. But in UDFA, that's what it's for. Like, this is an absolute no risk move. If he works out, great, you win. If he didn't, you didn't risk anything. And raise on right, really good size, not necessarily really good speed, but I like him as a technician as well. He gets to slot in behind a couple of large corners that have more tools than he does and also a ton of skill. He can see how they play it try and develop his game. I can see him being one of those very good short to medium press man corners who can be all up in, you know, your opposing 
top receivers business and really limiting and, and pushing. That's what he's good at. He's yeah, a length. Brandon Browner type. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great comparison. And he can grow into that role. To get him for free, I thought he was absolutely draftable. I had a draftable grade on him, you know, mid-fifth. And to get him, you know, again, maybe there's something in a medical dossier. Maybe there's something off the field that we didn't see. But just based on tape and his physical profile alone, you know, mid to low fifth was about where I had him. So a great value for Carolina. That brings us... Finally, uh, to our final couple of segments, uh, both report card and our win total ceiling and floor. Report card, if you're new here, if you're not familiar with what this is, we assign uh, one of three different grades to four different categories, either up, even, or down to front office, coaching staff, offensive talent, or defensive talent. Of course, this is about, uh, you know, changes that have made this offseason. Like, where are they relative to last year front office uh even though we we typically try not to make it a policy of judging front offices by drafts immediately after they happen because it takes a few years to really judge a draft class uh, considering the moves that they made in free agency for assets that we do know what they are uh and also you know respecting the aggression of the trade to uh to at least try to get out of the cycle of mediocrity and, and you know get themselves their own you know maybe joe burrow of the future right somebody who can almost single-handedly resurrect a franchise. I respect the aggression to go do that. So obviously we got to go up there. Uh, Coaching staff, this one's tough because I love Steve Wilkes. Yes. Love Steve Wilkes. But it's not just about bringing in Frank Reich. It's about all the assistance that Frank brought with him, Mm -hmm. uh, both at the coordinator level and the position coach level. This is a phenomenal staff. And overall a better staff than I think than what they had in Carolina last year. Even though, again, I, I do wish that Coach Wilkes got a shot. Uh, yeah. I I would overall say that the the staff in totality is better this year. So that's an up. Um, and then offensive talent, got to be up just from Bryce Young alone, right? That's an easy one. And defense, it's largely the same pieces. They've added a few names, you know, Von Bell here and there. Um, uh, you know, Shy Tuttle they added. But we're, we're going to go even on that one, uh, which is fine because it was already a very talented defense. So that's not a negative. It's not a positive. They're just keep on going, keep on trucking. Yeah. And really the way these categories line up, you might say, but you said so many great things about Coach Vero. Like, isn't that better? Well, that's in the coaching category. And that's one of the reasons that even though we both have tremendous respect for Coach Wilkes and what he was able to do in a very difficult situation, we're going to give coaching up because, you know, getting in Jiro Avero as DC is a significant move for this franchise and coaching overall, but you can't double count it. It goes in coaching and not in defense. In defense, they have a lot of the same guys who are very talented. Neutral is not a negative here. So we keep that one flat. But overall, three up arrows and a flat, fortunes are looking up for the Carolina Panthers. And it's why I would not be shocked whatsoever if not only do they win the division, but like we said earlier, if they actually do damage in the playoffs because they might be the only NFC South team that's talented enough to do that, uh, like top to bottom, looking at quarterback, weapons, offensive line, defense, everything. Um, like it's it's a it's a more complete team, I think, than New Orleans and, and then Atlanta. Not that Atlanta and New Orleans are bad. We even said so. Like they're solid. But Carolina has the potential to be good and good right now. Uh, Now, that brings us to ceiling and floor. I do have them at a 10-win ceiling, which is the same as New Orleans, even though I believe that they would have a better shot to win in January than New Orleans. The reason why I have a 10-win ceiling is I do believe that there will be some growing pains with a rookie quarterback early on, which might put them into a little bit of a hole that they have to climb out of. And we know that NFC South teams rip wins off each other all the time anyway. So even though I do have their win total uh, or their win ceiling being the same as New Orleans, I do think that they, you know, by the time we get to December, I think they will be a better team than New Orleans would be. Uh, and my floor, uh, just if everything takes way longer to get going than we anticipate, my, my floor for them is still seven. So they're still going to be somewhere in the middle of the league. Um, but I I want to, again, reiterate that their upside is, is higher than everybody else in the division. I think we agree on the core. 
of this team being incredibly strong and it is not what I would call a typical first choice overall team. They did indeed have to trade up to get that, but they're starting from a better place. They have more base in place. They have very good, very young offensive line. They can run the ball, even though they've traded running backs and they have a great defense. And by great, I mean great talent wise, not great results wise. I think it can be great results wise, but those are two things that a team can lean on when a rookie quarterback is growing. If they get injuries to other key spots, you can always go back just like they did in the second half of last year and say, we are going to establish the run and play some defense, keep ourselves in games and then try and win it in the fourth quarter. So floor is seven for me as well. I'm going to risk the biscuit a little bit on the top end and go 11 because Bryce Young has magic in a bottle. He's showed it at every level. And I'm going to say if he stays on the field, which is what everybody's worried about, but he did it in the SEC. If he stays on the field, I know rookie quarterbacks struggle. I get it. Again, he's coming into a what I would call typically more talented situation than your average number one overall pick that is running for his life because there's holes in the offensive line. He doesn't have targets. We talked about it a lot. Bryce Young's got plenty of targets. He's got a very solid run game. He's got a great line in front of him. And he is very good. He is very quick. He makes decisions very quickly. Uh, A lot of times they're right. More often than not, that's the thing you come away from his tape with is he makes a lot of decisions really fast. And sometimes quarterbacks that do that make the wrong ones really fast. With him, he makes them very quickly, but they're almost always the right decision. He's just extremely high quality in that way. He's got an offensively minded head coach. He's got a guy that played, you know, more than 15 years very recently as a quarterback in the NFL. He has sort of every ability to do well. And I think he might be the extremely rare case like rookie Justin Herbert that has a very good season. And if he has a season anywhere near that with the pieces around him that Herbert didn't necessarily have his rookie year, they could win double digit games and it could be 11. Would not be shocked nope. whatsoever. Uh, now, if you're a Panthers fan watching all this, that's music to your ears, and you're psyched for the season, and all you want to do is buy Panthers gear, please go to Homage uh, and help us out because not only do they have an NFL license, but they have like 30 plus designs for every single NFL franchise, including designs just like this hoodie that I'm wearing, which is incredibly soft and super comfortable. It's my mm-hmm. favorite hoodie that I wear. Uh, you know, EJ, uh, we were looking around different designs, uh, and not just for Panthers fans, but we were looking around different designs that they have uh, this week. And, you know, the 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 rookies that were like drawing their own <laughs> logos from memory, they literally put those onto shirts and they're phenomenal. I, I, have, I have the Jags one coming in the mail right now just because I love it so much. So, again, I encourage you just go check out the design, see if there's anything you like. Uh, we get a per, uh, percentage of every single purchase that's made through our link on homage. Um, so, you know, buying anything to support your team also directly supports us. Uh, and it's, it's a great way to, uh, support the show if you feel so inclined and we would appreciate it if you do that. Um, uh, we'll be back tomorrow talking Buccaneers. Um, that will require some extra refreshments because, oh my God. Things are looking bleak in Tampa Bay. Uh, it's it's fair it's to say great. the outlook is not the same as no. the one we delivered <laughs> to you, Carolina Panthers fans. So take heart. Your division rivals may be staring at some hard times. Well, they also might be staring at some great times because if they come back in 2024 with Caleb Williams, a lot of Panthers fans are going to be pretty sad about it. Yeah. And they certainly seem to be... Uh, Aiming that direction. Yes, yes, whether intentionally or unintentionally. So uh, come back tomorrow to hear all about the uh, tragedy of the 2023 Buccaneers. And then we're picking our NFC South division winner on Friday as well for our uh, division recap episode. So with that, see you guys back here, same time, same place. And until then, later. Later.